I would like to invite uh, a very, very special guest to join us. This is Phil Moulton. He is a former world champion in karate. He's a world record holder. He's got an eighth Dan black belt in karate, and he has over 25 years experience in bodyguarding. He's one of the UK's most respected personal security and close protection specialists. Welcome, Phil. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invite. Oh, thank you. So let's get straight into the interview. I mean, I'll tell you something. As a young boy, I always wanted to be a body bodyguard. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always thought it was an impossible aspiration. Um, it's definitely not something that a school career advisor recommends. And it's a bit like butlering, really. Um, do you think that's right? I, th- I think a lot of it has come down to the lack of understanding to, to what the actual job is all about. Most people think that it's, it's all ex military, keep losing you through WhatsApp. Um, I think a lot of people tend to think it's all military, ex police, etc. And it's for, for the specialist group, but it's becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, for the world around, for people to get involved in it. Career advisors and people from schools have probably never heard of it, only but well, it's becoming more in the forefront now from the films with the Whitney Houston, the, the TV series, etc. So it's becoming more and more popular, should we say. Um, yeah. Probably back in our days, um, never even heard of, never even, <laughs> but it is one of the oldest and most established professions in the world. Um, there we go. But yeah. social media, one well, thing's it's praise far. That's really interesting, actually. I mean, and that brings me really nicely onto my my next question. Really, I mean, can anyone be a bodyguard, or does it take a specific kind of person? Well, firstly, we've got to address um, the aspects of the law and the legal requirements, health and safety, and everything else. There is a legal requirement nowadays for people to hold a license. We all have to have a license, which is the Security Industries Authority. Having that license means that you've attended a course and passed a level three course. Um, For the character side of a person, it's a different type of person that we're looking for, really. They've got to be quite, obviously, everyone's professional in their own right. Um, We're looking for people who are very, very calm, people who are very level-headed. They can work under stress and a lot of pressure because it comes down to what you're doing as well as what we're doing because it's hand in glove, having the fun, um, of what we do. Yeah, with um, all these WhatsApp. So it comes down to basically the type of person you've got to be able to adapt and all into different social cir- circles. Working with a celebrity in one minute, and then you could be working in a gala uh, mm-hmm. evening the next. So it comes down to basically um, the person themselves if they want to get involved in that. But there is a legal requirement nowadays. But once you've done that legal requirement, then that's the stepping stone for them to start progressing forward. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so, just like butlering, there's a lot of uh, obviously very famous fictional bodyguards, um, like Richard Madden's character in the BBC drama or the class- classic um, Kevin Costner film. Um, so, how do you think fiction compares to reality? Well, the, the social media has done uh, some good things and it's also done some things, it's made it very, very glamorous should we say it's not as glamorous as it makes out it's like every every industry that we have uh once social media gets onto it the films they make it really glamorous because if they portrayed it in the real way people probably won't watch it because it's a lot of it's all about the planning preparation um the risk assessments putting things in place profiling the counter surveillance the surveillance etc so there is an awful lot of planning into it so if you look at 100 percent you're probably looking around about 95% of that is all the planning side of it. The 5% of it is the exciting side of it when you're moving around, the principal around, etc. So there is an awful lot of planning. Uh, so the glamorous side of it is what the, the social media and the films portray. But uh-huh. the reality side of it is exactly what probably what you do, all the prep work, all the back, back of house work. So there is an awful lot of work goes on behind where people don't even see um, and people never get to see that, which is a shame. Um, they just see the end product where you're walking down with a person uh, and protecting them while you're doing what you're doing in the end of uh, the day, really. Yeah. So, I mean, 
That's true. I mean, I often use the analogy of the swan with the the, yeah. the swan gliding across the water with its little legs going mad underneath. So, so I think we're just the same in that. Hundred <laughs> percent. It's, it's basically people have the perception that they say, oh, everything's running smooth. But they don't realise that behind all that, there's an awful lot of work going behind. And it's not just the bodyguard. Um, we, we have to look at the different scenarios because it's not just the bodyguard. We call it the cost protection, um, executive protection officer or personal protection officer. So they're all the same thing. But within that group, we have a team leader. Mm-hmm. We have an RST team, which is a resident security team. So if you're working with a high net worth family, you would have a team of security people who protect the house. And then you have the advanced team who go do all the recce's, the advanced work, the counter surveillance and the surveillance lads, and lasses who do all the all the sneaky beaky stuff, etc. So there is a big team. So one person is like sliding along and everyone else is running around behind them. Very, very much like what you're doing. Mm. Um, person who's doing all the buttlering and the head butler etc and everyone else is milling around and making them look really professional so there is a, an awful lot of synergy be, behind it um it's not just one person there is a big team behind that person as well brilliant okay that's really interesting i mean over the years obviously i've worked with a very closely with a lot of close protection operatives um so, some have really stood out as being a, a step above the rest, to be honest. Um, but what what do you think makes a great bodyguard? I think at the end of it, um, it's, about, it's about the person who takes the job seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like anything. Any professional, any trade that we do, is having the integrity, taking the job seriously. You're not there for the glamour. You're there to do a job at work. Uh, where we're protecting somebody's life, it could be a threat, a real threat. So we have to really take that job seriously. It's not just about turning up, uh, looking smart and basically just doing doing the nonsense. It's about making sure that we actually understand what's going on. Um, and we don't overstep our limitations as well. Um, we do see an awful lot of people become more um, important than the person that we're looking after. Ah, so they do. become the, the big status and the, the starstruck people. And you'll see a lot of that where the, the paparazzi are there and they're having a photograph taken with somebody and the bodyguard's actually in the frame and they're not looking at the principal huh. but they are looking at the principal they're actually they should be scoping the the, the actual crowd mm. so they're they're dragging the, the fame out of everyone so i think there's a lot of discretion that is required i mean i'm sat in a room where i'll show you shortly where i've got lots of photographs and these photographs were not taken by me these photographs were taken by other people while I was working. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of them, in fact, 90% of them, you'll see me looking at my art rather than looking at the person who I'm protecting. So it's, it's about a person who, who takes the job seriously. That's, that's it, really, in one shell. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fantastic. That, you're saying about the photographs on your wall there. It might, reminds me of the film Kingsman, where he's, he shows all the headlines that don't involve what he did because he did what he did. So yeah. um, I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, so if someone likes the sound of this, if someone wants to work in the security industry, um, how should they go about it? I mean, what should their first step be? I always say to people, this is... I've been I've been in this job twenty well, just twenty seven years, um, and I got into it just as the market was sort of evolving. Um, and basically, what I always tell people who come onto my courses or contact me, research. It's all about researching because there is a lot of people out there, and again, we, we reflect on a lot of different industries who are there just to set the money off of folk. Um, and this is basically not just committing a lump of money. They're also committed an awful lot of time, 150 hours to commit to yeah. doing a cost protection course. So it's making sure that they do the research on the job. And also, once they've got the job, making sure that they know exactly what they want to do with that job. You see a lot of folk out there who actually go to cost protection, but never really researched it. They don't know the ins and outs and basically read books. A lot of people don't read books anymore. If you're using YouTube, you're going to get you're going to get sidetracked by the, the glitch side of it, which then brings us back into giving the wrong idea of what we're doing. So it's about researching, looking at the past history of the person who's going to be the, the trainer. 
as well. Have they got a background? You don't just want a person who's a trainer because they're just a trainer. I've been doing this, as I said, for a long time, but I use experience, not just uh, from the book. So somebody can ask me a question and I can answer that question because more often than not, I've been in that situation myself. So I'm passing on experience, life experience, very much like yourself. Mm. You, know, it, you know, we are very similar in what we do. Yeah, there's, there's so, no substitute. No. Um, so we supply the, the lesson plans, etc. But then supporting that, you're giving that life experience. So going back to your question, it's about research and making sure it's very, very important that they understand that the job they're getting into. Um, it's not just a job where you see the glass and the glamour. It's about basically sometimes you're protecting a person's life. It's understanding yeah. as well. Yeah, no, very true. It's a serious thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, as I was saying, I've, I've, over the years, I've worked with with a lot of um, CPOs, um, and in the past, there's always been a lot of synergy between the role of a butler and the role of a bodyguard. Um, what do you think the the future holds for the for the two roles? I think that the actual roles are evolving because it's becoming more and more people like the high net worth families, etc. So the roles are evolving where the butler is in charge of the household. And the close protection as person is coming in as a guest, really. And they have to work within the, this remit. So basically, you're doing the close protection work. It doesn't mean that everyone's in charge of everyone else. It's basically, you have to work alongside everyone. It's making sure that it's continuity. So the roles are evolving. The close protection aspect of it is getting... Um, there's, there's quite a few thousand people who are licensed. I won't go into the people who are not licensed. Uh, because that's um, a different matter, um, or untrained. Uh, but the butler inside of it, that's becoming more and more, it's becoming more popular because mm -hmm. people are interested in what they see on social media. So the social media aspect of it is doing us some favours by doing the promotion side of it. It is an old skill, and it is a skill what you do and what I do in, in certain ways. So there is a lot of crossover, and it's becoming more popular because people are becoming more interested in it. Um, so at the end of it, it's, a, it's about getting it out there, just sort of getting rid of the tiny side of it where they think it's the old upstairs and downstairs. It's completely different. Um, Post protection people and butlers, they're not one in the same, but there's an awful lot of synergy between us where we have to, we have to share information. Uh, when we're profiling a principal, who best to go to to get information about the person that we're guarding? because we won't get all the information from the person that we're protecting. We have to glean information from other sources as well to make sure that we've got the full package. Um, so there is a lot, an awful lot of things where things will evolve. Um, and it's, it's, it's basically not just in the UK, it's worldwide. It is worldwide. Mm. Um, the US, they love the, the, the bottler in, um, and obviously the cost protection side, it's a huge market, massive yeah. market. Definitely an international market. Um, well, yeah, I mean, so what? What do you think? What's the what, what's the best thing? And, and actually, what's the worst thing um, about um, about both being a bodyguard and about training operatives? I think the worst thing about um, bodyguards or being a bodyguard is that we're not in it for glory, should we say? Mm -hmm. um, but well, people have got this stigma of what a post protection person looks like. I mean, I'm five foot, five foot nine, five foot ten on a good day. Um, <laughs> In I'm, pushing, yeah, I'm pushing six there. Uh, but when you tell people what I do, my next door neighbours don't even know what I do. Mm. And so you don't go around and telling people. But then it's that stigma and that stereotyping of what people see as a, a personal protection officer or a bodyguard. Um, so that's the negative side of it. I mean, we do get an awful lot of bad press. That's because people don't understand the job that we do. They just see the end products where people are walking around, etc. Some of them are not the best. Some of them are bullies. So if you look at some folk out there, you throw the weight around, they become a little bit more important, pushing the chest out, etc. Um, which sort of brings the industry down. And then we, we go back to the untrained guard. Uh, and that's that's not just bad on ethics, it's also uh, bad for safety. 
is if you're an, having a bad, bad or an untrained protection officer, they're not only going to compromise um, the job, and dilute the job, they're going to put people's safety and lives at risk because they haven't got a clue what they're doing. It's having, it's knowing your limitations, what to do, uh, but it's also down to the principal to make sure that they vet the person that they're, they're picking. Not just for CV neither. CVs are brilliant. Make yep. fantastic aeroplanes. <laughs> you've got to have that substance be, behind you. The good thing about it, there is a lot of positives. Uh, there is a lot of positives when you're making people feel more relaxed, etc. You know, so the negative side of it are the untrained people, the people who drag down uh, the industry because they're unqualified. Mm. Um, and then, sadly, that's what people will remember. They will remember the bad rather than the good. Uh, always the way. It's a shame. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. Um, I'll tell you what, I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at you and I'm looking at some absolutely incredible medals right behind you. So um, I'd just like to talk about uh, karate for a second. Um, now, you, you've, you've reached an, uh, an exceptional level uh, in your training, something that very few people do. Um, how's that influenced your life and your career? Um, well, this is my 50th year, believe it or not. But I started when I was, I was, started when I was 10, 1970, um, as a young lad. Um, and it's influenced my life in a, a massive way. It's discipline. Uh, the thing that you can see behind me is an open all styles karate champion. That's for Qatar, uh, the European Championships. The Pacific certificate there in the corner, that's my eighth down. That's my original first down back in 1982. Um, I've got other certificates around the world, of, like judges and referees, etc. So these are some of them. Um, obviously, casualties of war, things go on in life, and you know we lose trophies here, there, and everywhere. But karate is maybe the, the type of person that I want to be. It's given me discipline. Um, it's made me more and more focused. Um, and it's also made me more aware of my limitations, what I can and what I can't do, etc. Because as a karate guy, people just think, well, you're a tough guy. Hate violence. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm an eighth dam. Uh, and it's a registered one. So it's not a self-awarded one. It makes you feel more comfortable, more confident. Um, and that will hopefully pass on to the person that you're working with as well. Once they feel you're relaxed, you're confident in your skills and your ability, they become more relaxed with what you do as well. So it comes back down to the training as well. Aspects of it, I suppose. That's, that's basically how it's made me. Um, in, in my old book there, which is, I've, I've got a copy there, and I'll show you short. Aha, I was just going to ask you about your book, actually. So in your book, um, The Bodyguard, um, yeah, please tell us about, tell, show us a copy, please. Tell us a bit more about it. So the book here, you can see that it's the right way around, yeah? Yeah, um, so this, this was wrote my own little fair hand. It took me 10 years, believe it or not. Sat on the beach. Uh, when my wife was sunbathing and <laughs> it, was, it, was um, it was all my scribble notes because I used to get so bored it was like a ritual every some holiday I'd get a little note I'd start writing and basically that's what it was and a couple of years ago uh, well, back in 2008 2009 there was a spate of uh, burglaries and attacks on footballers if you remember um, they were it was basically some in Manchester some in Liverpool etc so they were targeting football players. And I was working with two footballers, and I think they'll be pleased that I mentioned them, Rocky Santa Cruz and Jason Roberts, MBE. And they said, you've got all these notes. Why don't you just put some, something together? And I thought nothing of it. Honestly, I really, I just thought, one day I will do. Um, years later, um, I was speaking to a chap on LinkedIn called Ian McCarg, fantastic guy. Um, and he just contacted me out of the blue and he said, I'd love to do an online programme of you for Extreme Sports Karate. Would you be interested? So I said, of course I would. Did a little bit of a magazine thing, which I'll send in a link. And it was all about my karate, etc. Then he said, have you ever thought of writing a book? I said, well, actually, I have. And I sent him all the memoirs, everything, all 350 pages. And four months later, he produced this. Wow. Um, verified it obviously he had to contact all the people some of them that he couldn't contact because some of them are not with us any longer um 
and he produced this. And this is basically my journey. As I said, through karate, um, I was bullied as a young lad. Um, brought up on a rough council estate in North Manchester, it says on the book. Um, and he had to find my way through life, single parent, etc. Not deprivation, but I had a hard upbringing. And karate made me. Uh, so all my book is basically how I got through the bullying side of it. And also how I basically ended up looking after people and not stopping them, but helping them get through the bullying. Because people who employ people mm -hmm. like us get bullied in one form or another. Um, so my book is, is about a journey of mine, um, how I got through karate, some of the people I've protected, etc. So it's it's a good read, I think. Um, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of it indeed. Absolutely but, fantastic. Yeah. Um, I mean, I must admit, I, I'm reading it. Um, I, only, I only got it um, the other day. I'm already halfway through. Absolutely loved it. So I'm definitely going to recommend it to people to, to buy a copy. It's absolutely brilliant, available on Amazon. Um, and, and I'm guessing other places as well. <laughs> um, so, um, so tell me if people, and I'm sure I can't imagine why anyone wouldn't. So, if people want to come and train with you, uh, are you accepting students? Um, yeah, uh, what we're doing at this moment in time, because of the current situation with uh, mm -hmm. uh, COVID, etc., we're not allowed to teach because uh, of the social distance and etc. Our awarding body, which is the security well. Security Industries Authority, they grant us our licenses and they've sort of put a cap blanche and no more training for course protection, which is a shame, really, um, because we can deliver online stuff to a certain degree. OK, um, but what we're actually doing is building up uh, contacts between the, the industry and trying to develop a package which is going to be suitable for people. It's not just people coming in at the beginners at the, the start. It's going to be going all the way through. So we've got different levels. So if people want to join, they can, they're more than welcome. We can do an online program, um, a taster, because like I said, it's 150 hours, mm -hmm. a long time to do, a lot of time to commit. So if they wanted to do like taster courses, just to dip in and dip out, we can do that because obviously that's, that's basically giving them an understanding of what we're doing. So we can put courses together, which can be delivered online. The practical aspects of it, that's got to be hands on because what we have to do is to make sure it's put into practice. And again, we do have people out there who do just PowerPoint. What I do on the course is they'll go through the full course and they have to actually put a operation together and it's got to be tested. And then somebody else would test it. So it's not just me or you doing it. One of the other students, they would have to make sure it works as well. So we swap it around and make it as difficult as possible, but in a good way. <laughs> so the understanding how it works. Yeah. It is, you know, so there's a lot of courses that we can do. The, um, the weapons awareness course, we teach self-defense. So there's a lot of things that people can pick from to help them push forward. Because remember, um, as we're trying to sell ourselves, the better we package ourselves and more skills we've got, the more sort of appealing we become to people. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, I mean, I'm absolutely fascinated by it. I'd like to sign up tomorrow. I'll tell you, I think it sounds absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, that's that's all the questions I've got. But I just like to say, absolutely. It's been absolutely fascinating. I've really enjoyed speaking to you. And I'm sure everyone who uh, watches this is going to absolutely love it. And I, I bet you're going to be inundated with questions. Um, of course, if anyone does want to ask any questions, as always, please just uh, write them in the comments underneath. Uh, I'm guessing they'll all be for Phil and not for me, but I'll pass them across to him and um, so he can sort of answer them for you. Um, well, so I'm working with you and, and uh, you know, I think this, there is a lot of uh, synergy there where we can't keep talking about regarding training and uh, what you do, how it's going to help people. I think close protection people, we, we did touch on that before. People have to be trained to what they do. We do protocol training. And they, I've just brought this little book for you. This is an old book, um, and it's got the Gentleman's Pocket Guide. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, it's lifted a bit down. higher for the camera. Oh, there we go. It covers down everything, even down to tying the tie materials, uh, what suits to wear, etc. So I've used that for years. Um, and it's basically an understanding. This is where we go to what makes a good bodyguard. 
it's, it's having a little bit of a reference where you can go to and think, right, how can I develop this? So somebody who's in the, um, becoming a, a butler, they, they've got to remember that they're also putting themselves, not at risk, but they're putting themselves on a level where people will start looking at them, paying attention to them. So it, it's basically trying to re-educate every, every single person so everyone's got a good background of the skills that they want to learn. I, mean, I think that's hugely useful and important. I mean, I know myself as a butler, I've been had plenty of altercations with paparazzi when I've been um, looking after clients. Um, one of the clients I used to look after was on the Al-Qaeda hit list. So, I mean, you know, you do have to be a bit well, more than a bit careful. And it's important people have an understanding of these things. Exactly, yeah. And I think we all learn from each other. If one person says, no, that's not for me. Well, that person is very narrow minded. And that's where they will sit. So what you've got to try and do is embrace everything, like surveillance and counter surveillance. That's a massive part of what we do. And there's there's not many people who actually teach that out in the actual industry. They, they, they dip the toe into it here and there. But as a butler, you're going to be eyes and ears on the ground all the time. As the course protection team are out with the family, and the the rest of the team are inside, the butler and everyone else, if they're trained in certain things. Um, it, it's a massive asset. One quick, one quick, very, very quick example. I used to do work for football clubs, and I can't name them. Um, but what we actually did, we trained all our staff on surveillance and counter surveillance, especially when it went into a certain type of what was going on in the world. So they were trained in the very basic understanding of what to look for, body language, etc. And they were on the peripheral of what we were doing. So those, if you think of 45 people, we have 45 people, eyes and ears watching. And that's yeah. a massive, it's, you know, you're not paying for that as a cultural protection team, but that is an asset to what you're bringing in. So it's training your people into certain things. You don't have to make them all robots. You can give them a little bit of, not too much knowledge, but you're making them feel more comfortable. And it's helping them progress, making them feel safe as well. So Brilliant. it's a sharing of information. Okay, that's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and the, the, what's, the, what's the experience? The wisdom of crowds. The more people you have with eyes on the ground, the, yeah. the more eyes you have. Yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah, it's, brilliant. Yeah. Um, it's trying well, to expose people anyway. That's what we're trying to do. Get the get the get get all the bad folk out of the way. That's what we don't want to see. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. Well, I think we're going to have to sort of draw it to I could talk to you all day, to be honest. I yes. really could. But I think we'll have to draw it to a close. I tell you what, I'm going to ask you one sneaky quick question at the end. Chuck, Chuck Norris or Bruce Lee? Pound for pound, um, I'd say Bruce Lee. Good answer. I agree with you there. I can ask a good answer. <laughs> Chuck Norris would never agree, but Chuck Norris is, is a wonderful martial artist um, and he is a true karate cop. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no dispute in that fact. He's a fantastic martial artist, but Bruce Lee put the stamp on the mark. Uh, and he basically pushed things forward. My idol, so I'm a little bit biased there. But I do know this is a, a karate guy, brilliant guy, brilliant. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that. Put you on the spot with that one. I don't know if Chuck's going to watch this, but, you know, if he does, you know, we might be in trouble. But <laughs> I think, I think if a, a fellow karate guy uh, respect my opinion. And, um, well, he might not, but there you go. <laughs> I, I know he was good friends with Bruce Lee anyway, so I'm sure that uh, I'm sure he'll appreciate that. <laughs> it's the actual thing, the actual the way the dragon uh, fighting uh, part of it, the, the sequence was all basically sparring, um, and they were sparring constantly. And, and Bruce and Chuck, Chuck learned from Norris, uh, Chuck learned from Bruce, and Bruce Lee learned from Chuck. So again, we're going back to learning from people's yep. different skills. Definitely of everything just keep coming back to that one spot learning from each other that's absolutely brilliant that's it, yeah All right. well on that very positive note um and looking forward to of course the world's getting back to normal so you can do a bit more training and we'll do some stuff together as well but thank you very much for your time phil thank you very much um and please everyone at home subscribe to the channel there's gonna be some more great things like this happening so thank you very much Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.